God, he, he was a mess. He was crying in anxiety, knowing that was that Sita was perfect and saying, Why did Ram do that? This is the criticism, right? I get hit all the ladies said, Boy, you know what, Ram's so, so nice, but what did he do to Sita, you know? I get it all the time, it's like hmm. So I think it I mean every year I think I'm trying to make trying to defend Ram's character and I fail every time. But then I thought, let me investigate farther. There must be another reason why Ram so doing some research I found some devotees who actually knew the internal reason, which is not so much prevalent to everyone in this particular pastime. And that internal reason is really interesting. There were two there were two demons. They were called the Sar Saranka demons. They had performed austerities and penances, and they attracted to the, the presence of Lord Brahma, who asked, All right, you have performed so many austerities and penances, what do you wish? Well, we wish that we want liberation, but we want to act the same way we're acting. In other words, we don't want we can still act in a non Vedic way, but still we want liberation. And the only way that we will not get liberation is that if Sita, if, if Sita and Ram were separated. Because they knew Sita and Ram could never be separated. That was their understanding and it's a fact. The Lord can never be separated from His internal energy as the sun can never be separated from the sunshine. So they made that's the only condition that we will not be that we will not get liberation if they are separated. And so these demons were living in Ayodhya, and they were also influenced some people in Ayodhya, because when Ram left the planet, everyone went back to Godhead. Everyone, all of the citizens, went back to Godhead in Ayodhya except these two demons, because Ram arranged for Sita to be separated from him in order to destroy this austerity and this non-Vedic yogya, I don't, I don't know what you would call it, but this particular vow that these demons had, because these demons were just a few of many other demons who also got the similar benediction given by Lord Brahma. So this is the internal reason. And then as soon as these demons, when Ram and Sita were separated, they, their Brahma's, Brahma's benediction was no longer in effect. And therefore these demons were immediately died upon that and were, were, didn't get a chance to go back to Godhead because everyone in Ayodhya went back to Godhead when, when Ram left the planet. So this is the internal reason for why Ram did that. But in the mood of the relationship, although they were separated by distance, they were never separated because Sita was always thinking of Ram and Ram was always thinking of Sita. And eventually she left the world in that mood and uh, she went back to the spiritual world. So Ram used this particular event in order to destroy what is called non-Vedic austerities that the demons were trying to use. Because the de demons perform austerities. We know how Ravana got so many benedictions performing austerities. Arani Kashipu also got so many benedictions of performing austerities. The demons like and very enjoy performing austerities because austerities can give you power. Austerities can give you what we say control. And that, although they have no bhakti, they are good at austerities. And so in order to destroy any non-Vedic principles, Ram banished Sita in the forest. So this is the internal reason. And this is, this is given by Madhvacharya. So this, this uh, explanation that I just gave was given by Sri Madhvacharya. Well, that's a, and that's another one of the reasons that Ram gets criticized. But Ram is perfect, and although we may not understand what he does when he does it, because the Ramayana is so deep 
and so complex and so full of various types of meanings and activities that it takes a lot of really study to study the Ramayana deeply to understand really what is going on. It's very sweet, it's very deep. On the surface, it looks like one thing, but on another, on another level, it's Ram's love for all living entities as it plays itself out in different ways. So these are a few of the wonderful pastimes of the Lord. There are many of the pastimes of the Lord that have very deep, deep meaning. Um, the character of Ram is not like the character of Krishna, <laughs> although they're one and the same. We were explaining this how Ram is Maryada Purushottam. He is ideal, he's righteous, he follows morality, he keeps his promise, he says Ekapatni, when he was approached many times by ladies, we saw the play with Suparnaka, and also there was Vegavati, she also approached him. Both, he refused, because he said, I have taken the vow in this particular incarnation for one wife. And Krishna, he had 16,108. <laughs> and anybody who criticizes Krishna, uh, you know, they're wrong, obviously, but Krishna he can do whatever he wants to do, because <laughs> he's God. <laughs> and whatever he does is perfect. And he says, like, I'm not going to fight, and he fights. <laughs> and his cane is crooked, so you can't trust him. <laughs> you know, he's, he says, I'm going to meet you tonight, Radharani, Radharani. He's waiting, he never comes. You know. <laughs> Poor Radharani. <laughs> But that's Krishna. He's on a higher principle of, of spirituality and that we can't see why he does what he does until the, the Acharyas give us the explanations. But Ram is so righteous. He's always following morality, principles of religion, principles of civility. He is ideal in all. So people love to worship Ram because Ram we can follow the example of Ram, we can learn, we can't follow Krishna. <laughs> we can't follow Krishna because if you follow Krishna, you go to hell. <laughs> because only Krishna can do what Krishna does. <laughs> and it's perfect. And so there are many, many stories that we can learn from. Uh, there's a beautiful story how one particular, we know this story, when uh, the, the monkeys were on the on the uh, on the coast of what we know today as India, and they wanted to cross the ocean, so the plan was to build a bridge out of rocks. So in order for the rocks, the rocks don't float. <laughs> so Ram was writing his name on each of the rock, and as the rock was placed in the water. It was floating. These big, gigantic boulders were floating. And you see also, this particular planet w that we're on is floating in air. <laughs> it's huge. You can't even consider how much this planet weighs. It's billions and billions, trillions of tons. But still, it floats so nicely by the energy of the Lord. We call it gravity, but that's a name that people give by saying we don't know really what it is. <laughs> But it's the Lord's inter uh, uh, external energy working in that way. And so now he was writing, and then, so now the boulders had to be placed into the ocean. So Hanuman, he's there, and along with the monkeys, and they're all very big and powerful, they're taking these huge boulders and placing them in the water. And there's a little squirrel there. Some people say a spider, others say a squirrel. But the, the common terminology was a squirrel was kicking a little grains of sand into the ocean, thinking, I want to help the Lord build this bridge. So Hanuman's seeing this little squirrel, and he's so small, and apparently he's getting in the way. And he's afraid maybe I'll step on him. So step aside, squirrel. You know, we, this is man's work. And Ram notices what Hanuman is doing 
And so Naram says to Hanuman, Hanuman, he is doing as much as you are doing. You are working to your capacity, he is working to his capacity. That is devotional life. Devotional life is that if you work to your, or you serve with sincerity, using all your resources, that is the best possible thing you can do. So it doesn't matter what the outcome is, nor does it matter how, what you contribute in proportion to others, because devotional service is absolute. Therefore, Prabhupada used to say, someone is cleaning the temple room, and another person's out distributing book, books. They're both devotional service that Krishna is seeing, not so much the service, but the mood that the service is being rendered in. What is that mood to please the Lord and to push on religious principles? So using this example in the Ramayana, we see that this squirrel, what was he doing? Insignificant. Nothing was really happening, but that was, that's what he could do. And therefore, Ram ex accepted that as good as Hanuman. Now, that is the Supreme Lord. Samoham, Samabhuteshu, Namedueshu, Sthinapriya. He's equal to everyone. He envies no one. He's not partial to anyone. And he accepts the devotional service to, of everyone when it's rendered with the proper understanding. In other words, with the desire to please the Lord. So that's a nice example from the Ramayan, how the Lord doesn't discriminate. He simply accepts the mood of devotion. Hare Krishna. So maybe we'll stop there. I think there is now Kirtan. Uh, any questions or comments related to Ramayan? Do we have a microphone so the persons can be heard on the stream? They'll bring you a microphone, one minute. And that's for everyone to hear. Is there a window open here? It seems quite cold. Is that the AC? AC Bhaktivedanta Swami here Do you want to hear a, a nice little story about Prabhupada? Yes. One, I don't know where it happened. I think it was in the United States. One, one devotee went out on book distribution. And he was a new devotee. He didn't know much about Krishna consciousness. We do that. We send out the new persons to do books. So he was out there. He hands the man the book. And the man's looking at it. And turns over on the other side. And he sees a picture of Srila Prabhupada on the other side, and it says, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami. So the man looks at the book distributor, and he says, What does A.C. mean? And the book distributor says, Always cool. <laughs> And the man thought, oh, that's nice. Yeah. <laughs> he, he agreed. <laughs> so he didn't know what AC meant, but he thought, you know, this is, seems like this is the right thing to say. <laughs> so, oh, he's cool. <laughs> okay, I'm sitting. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Sri Sri Ram. The Lord Ram uh, is, was and will be a great sage, not the greatest, and the he's great... The, he's the Lord. And the great Lord indeed, and, and um, prophet, if you will, uh, by all means. Um, yeah, he's everything. Yeah. Everything auspicious fits into that definition. Yeah. Why would... Srila Prabhupada of most blessed memory and most blessed holiness prohibit or even commanded not to place the murti of Lord Ram on the altar. No, you just go to our temple in uh, Bhaktivedanta Manor, you'll see. 
we have Sita Ram, Lakshman, Hanuman, deities are there. Beautiful, full-size deities, the same size as Radhalan and Ishvara. Absolutely beautiful, but I, I have heard from uh, responsible no, sources no. that Srila Prabhupada no. prohibited no. placing. No, because he established the, the Mumbai temple. In the Mumbai temple, there's Sita Ram, Lakshman, Hanuman there, and Prabhupada was there for the installation. He actually said, install them. You see three altars, you see Gornitai, you see Radha Rasabihari, and on the far altar, Sitaram Lakshman Hanuman is there. Prabhupada authorized that, so that, that is not correct. Well, Prabhupada wanted them to be, you'll find it also there, it's in our temple in uh, Washington, D.C., Sitaram Lakshman Hanuman is there, and the New Vrindavan, they were also there, in the New Jersey temple there. You go around the world, you'll find there are many temples, but Sita Ram Lakshman Hanuman, yeah. But I know for sure, in establishing the Mumbai temple, Prabhupada specifically said, one altar for Sita Ram Lakshman Hanuman. Yeah. So somehow or other, somebody's trying to give you wrong information. <laughs> I accept that. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, it's actually true. Yeah. So we wouldn't do anything that Prabhupada would prohibit. That's for sure. So the fact that we have, we have deities everywhere indica indications that it was actually Prabhupada's desire. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that uh, correct, uh, correct, uh, correct. Uh, Thank you. Because we sometimes can be uh, victims of what is called misinformation. Yeah, this is the age of misinformation. <laughs> this goes on all the time. There's a whole scenario about that. Anything else? Yes. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. <laughs> yeah, hi. Um, I just wanted to maybe get your comment on um, a theory and a thought. You said that the Ramayana is quite a complex story with lots of interpretations. and um, well, There's a lot of... What we have is not... The, there's 24,000 verses to the Ramayana. Yeah. Well, it was only specifically about the the circle that um, Ram draws around for Sita to stand inside. Um, oh, that was Lakshman when he drew that circle? To mm -hmm. protect her. Yeah. And I was wondering whether that was um, symbolic of the control, like you mentioned about money, how it can either be good or it can be bad, and sometimes like protection can be good and it can be bad, and that she wanted to protect that deer, she wanted to like escape from the circle, and go and look after the deer and it turned out that the deer was actually the a demon the yeah. demon yeah and it was a trap so i was wondering whether the circle um whether the demon was actually representative of too much control and that she was unable to express herself and that she had a lot of care and heart for the world that was then being limited by the circle where she had to stay inside why did she not honor the circle that's pretty much your question um, or whether we, whether we can. She became sympathetic to Ravana's. Ravana had power and he knew how to speak. Imitating a saintly person, he entered into her soft heart and made her feel that she had to do something to satisfy his needs. She started to feel unhappy that this sadhu was fasting and he had no food and she was the one that was being asked to help him. So she, her, what we say, her good intentions, her emotions, overshadowed her intelligence. She forgot to obey what she should have obeyed, Lakshman, by staying in that circle, because he knew the place was full of demons, and if he, she stayed within that circle, she would be protected. But, Sometimes, when we have good intentions, but they're misplaced, they get us in trouble. <laughs> so her intentions were well, because she was thinking, oh, he's hungry, and I can provide food, and he's asking me for food. I can't refuse him. But Ravana was tricky. He said, I'm so tired. She said, come, I'll give it to you. 
she was going to do it from the circle, but he said, I can't walk. I'm so weak. I'm so hungry. You'll have to come and bring it to me. And then she didn't even consider anything else, and she left the circle, and that was her downfall. So soft-heartedness, misplaced, can also be a form of, you know, what we say, it could create the opposite reaction. And Prabhupada tells stories in this relationship. Can I, can I respond to that? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I think that, um, yeah, I agree with you that the good intentions and the warm heart can sometimes be um, uh, abused and misplaced and that uh, sometimes you can lose yourself in, in giving and, and caring. Um, my, uh, my question was more about whether Lakshman's um, intention of protecting her at the risk of her not being herself was actually uh, too much over control and that the demon no. is representative of No, he was, too trying, much he was trying to protect her. He knew this was the only thing he could do. She had insulted him, he could no longer stay there. She forced him to go into the forest to find. He knew Ram could take care of himself. There was no reason for him to go. He wanted to stay, but she insulted him so badly that he could no longer stay there. And he said, he also said, and it's mentioned, I know when when, when we come back you won't be here. He even said that. But she couldn't hear that. (laughs) So it wasn't an overprotection. It was the it was, it was it was what was needed at the time. That's all he could do. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, my question is that, uh, like we say that God is supreme, and without the God's will, there is uh, even if belief can't move. So. Uh, yeah, that's true. Yes, so God could have protected all that from happening, isn't it? Because God's supreme. The story that you were talking about right now. So my question is that do you think it, the entire thing that happened was in, in, inevitable? It's probably not even seen as part of the, fault or anything. Yeah. It's just that it was an, uh, there was a bigger plan to right. so that, you know, That's that was fair. the only way in which Ravna could be defeated. Probably, I don't know, I mean, I just, it's just a yeah. question. That's, that's also true. The Lord's plan was ultimately to, uh, you know, rid the world of the demons, especially headed by Ravana. But you'll see there's dude, there's different levels that these these activities are going on. They're going on in the human level, and then they're going on on the transcendental level at the same time. You're speaking from the transcendental position, so that's also correct. But then you see the frailties that come by way of the human level, and that these are messages that we can learn from, what to avoid, and of course the positive things, what we can adopt in our own life. So if we see from the transcendental level, it means that Sita was not at fault at all, because it was all a bigger plan. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Krishna can make the whole world Krishna conscious right now. That's a fact. This, you know, but what are we doing? We're struggling to do it. We're trying to be his instrument. Why? He wants to give us the credit. God can do anything. It's not It's like Prabhupada said. He can change, change day into night and night into day. He's all-powerful. All-powerful means there's, no, there's nothing outside of his jurisdiction. Everything is within his power. He can turn he can turn the demons into saintly persons, <laughs> but that's not what he does because he allows the individual soul to act on their own choice, and when they choose righteousness, spirituality, they grow and they overcome their material life, and then they actually qualify themselves to go back to the spiritual world. So. God can force us to love him, but he doesn't do that, because love has to be voluntary. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Yes, question, yeah. Guruji, thank you. Very nice, informative class. Uh, My question is, uh, we have seen the Leela of Krishna, we can see he can do so many things out of the world. But when you like, like see Ramachandra, what he does, 
we cannot match the opulence of Ramachandra with Krishna. So my question here, uh, if Ramachandra and Krishna on the same level, according to opulence, why Ramachandra need help to make a bridge to go from one side to Lanka? Can he not just use his opulence? Yeah. Go other side. Yeah. And rescue. Yeah. Sita. Yeah. So w why he did it? He can make you Krishna conscious overnight, but he doesn't. He wants you to work for it. <laughs> so <laughs> he's all powerful. I just g I gave that same explanation. Just like Brahman said to Prabhupada, you know, Lord Chaitanya came to India, and he traveled throughout the whole subcontinent, and he. He actually made the whole subcontinent of India Krishna conscious by spreading the holy name everywhere. So then the question came to Prabhupada, well, since he was here, why didn't he make the whole world Krishna conscious? Prabhupada said he'd save it for me to do. <laughs> he wants to give credit to his devotees. He wants his devotees to become purified by engaging in devotional service. Really, I understand what he's saying, but on the way, if you see what happens, what happens to Ramachandra, what happens to Sita? Yeah. In our material sense, we see both of them like separated husband wife, and they went through so much suffering. Apparently, so, apparently. <laughs> From our perspective, it looks like that. But those on the transcendental platform don't suffer. <laughs> There is the, that's their lila. That's the that's the playing out of their relationship with the Lord. So basically, what you're saying is nobody should do anything, and God should do everything. <laughs> we just sit back and get the benefit. <laughs> that's not the way He works. As I said, love means voluntary. You have to work for it. <laughs> And that's the purification process. Otherwise, how would you get purified? And the Lord gives us everything. He gives us, He provides the intelligence. He provides the facility. He provides His mercy in so many ways. But still, it's up to the individual soul to make it happen. <laughs> that's us. Mm -hmm. Is that all right? You agree? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Yes, Krishna Gandhi. Hi, Krishna. Um, just uh, one thing on, on going back on that point of Sita Devi. Um, yet, yeah, looking not looking at the externals that um, you know she 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 came out of that um, circle and she was taken by Ram, uh, Ravan. But um, in terms of when she was in those situations, she upheld her integrity and um, her values. Right. Um, when she was taken by Ram she, in that forest, where they, they Ravan, sorry, Ravan in the forest, mm -hmm. and uh, she was attacked in many directions, which women get sometimes, you know, so many different nobody, directions. Nobody could withstand Problems what she did. In. Her her love was so strong, her dedication was so strong that she was willing to give up her life rather than give up her chastity. Exactly. Yeah. So I was thinking, such amazing example to follow in in terms of looking at her character and her right. integrity. So. All those situations externally went on, but it, if you look inside who she really was, she didn't actually need to be protected. But those, those, I was thinking, but those things happened to show what amazing qualities, uh, qualities she had and yeah. going into yeah, Ramaki's yeah. action. So we glorify Sita for that. Otherwise, if you know, if, if it didn't happen, then we wouldn't be able to really appreciate or understand the glories of such a personality. And that's true with many people who have been given that same difficult situation by the Lord. Prabhupada didn't get any help when he started the movement. But he didn't give up. And he also undergo three heart attacks during the time that he was trying to spread Krishna consciousness. But still he continued. I mean, Prabhupada had to go on an ocean liner and experience two heart attacks on the ocean liner. I mean, Krishna could have gave him a ticket on, you know, on British Airways. <laughs> and he could have flew over, <laughs> but he didn't. 
appreciate why he wasn't there at the time, but anyway. So in other words, yeah, the, the Lord can do anything. But he, he, he allows the material energy to work in such a way, but he gives protection to his devotee. That's mentioned in the seventh canto. How the Lord puts the material energy in place and it works in a certain way. And if you want to be free from the effects of the material energy, you have to take shelter of the Lord. Otherwise, even if you're a devotee and you fail to take shelter, you're going to be subjected to what happens in the way the material energy works. The mode of passion, the mode of goodness, the mode of ignorance works in a certain way. So, you know, just like, you know, if, if you don't take care of yourself, you could get sick. <laughs> you can't blame it on Krishna. Well, why did Krishna allow me to get sick? Well, he says take care of yourself. <laughs> Uh, Maharaj, I was uh, hearing an analogy today morning. Hmm? Uh, My class this morning? Um, I think not yours, Gauram, who was in Chopati, where he said that uh, Sita Devi represents a Jivatma, Deer represents the illusory forces. Who? Uh, the, uh, the golden deer. Oh, okay. That represents, yeah. um, right. you know, those temptations, and when we cross the boundary, then the ten heads of Ravan represent the ten senses and the jiva gets entangled in the kingdom of Lanka yeah, perfect, and then yeah. Hanumanji acts as a spiritual master to bring that jiva back to its original constitutional yeah. position. Uh, what, what really, uh, like in our situation, what was the golden deer that made us fall, uh, fall down from the spiritual world? Want to be independent? <laughs> <laughs> the, the living entity has the same qualities of the, as the Supreme Lord in small quantity. So Krishna is called Swarat, and we are also Swarat to a, to a degree. So we have that independent nature. And just like we can choose, you know, we're here, we're listening, we're also celebrating the appearance. Well, well we could be in the movie while doing something else. That's our choice. But we wouldn't choose that because our desire is to is to, you know, advance in spiritual life. So we always have our choice. So the misuse of our independence brings us into the wrong, uh, in the wrong influence, and therefore that in that material energy influences that in, in that way. Material energy will work. You can't play around with it. It's dangerous. But if you take shelter of Krishna, then you're free from the effects of the material energy. But we think, oh, well, I can control the material energy. I can take a little sense gratification. Doesn't matter. I'll, I'll, I'll be all right. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> no. The only the only safe position is the shelter of the Lord. And how do we take shelter of the Lord? Chanting His name, by remembering Him, by praying to Him. All of these things allow us to free our consciousness from the effects of the material energy. And there is many examples of those who have been in the most dangerous situations, right? Life-threatening. Soon, as soon as they took shelter of the Lord, the whole situation was different. So Krishna is there. Rake Krishna Mordeke, Mordeke Krishna Rakeke. He can protect. He will protect. But he requires us to take his shelter. He says that, I would like to protect everyone, but no one comes to me, so what can I do? <laughs> they come to my external energy for protection, and there's no protection there. So that analogy was, is really beautiful. Yeah, and Sita, uh, she is so, the deer represents material attraction or illusion, and, she, and we, the jiva, is represented by Sita Devi. We look at the material energy, it appears to give us some satisfaction and happiness. We go for it, and something else happens. That's called maya. Maya means what appears to be something, but it's something different. That's the actual what maya means. It doesn't give you what it appears to. It gives you just the opposite. You may get some initial satisfaction, but in the long run, it causes distress. 
That's the material energy. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's a nice analogy. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That really sums up that whole pastime. <laughs> Any anyone else? I saw another hand somewhere. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much for a wonderful class. Um, I was uh, reflecting on that what you said that we many times judge without understanding, and that many times. The external situation forces us to be in a way which might not be the internal mood of a person. Right. And and then so I was thinking, how would you advise us in our daily lives? On what level do we respond? On the external situation which a person may act? Or it's not always so easy to understand. Internal. It takes a lot of reflection and takes some thoughtfulness to really try to go deeper into the, uh, the situation before you actually come to some conclusion. I mean, people have different opinions of what are the Hare Krishnas, you know, and you can find so many people have different opinions. But until they actually come and associate with devotees and take part in some of the activities, then they can understand. So you have to somehow or other enter into the, the, the mood of empathy before you can understand at least get the beginning to understand what, what the situation is like. But the world is the way it is, is that misunderstanding happens even amongst the most sincere people, even amongst the most qualified. It's just the way it is. It happens all the time. But we want to, if it does happen, it shouldn't create enmity or envy or break relationships. So we have to be careful that it doesn't get to the point where we get angry without any any for reason for getting angry. Or we get upset. And the mind has a tendency to take something and, and build it into an, a whole thing. The mind can take something small and turn it into a complete, you know, it's a major problem all of a sudden. So therefore we should not listen to the mind, we should try to understand things through scripture and through the examples of others. Yes, yeah. it takes some thoughtfulness, at least to prevent any kind of you know, disaster. Guruji, uh, I'm immensely impressed with your lecture, your because mainly because I can see that your intellectual justice comes from the way of the heart, your heart. And that's, that's quite impressive, and I mean that sincerely. So I wasn't going to ask that second question, but I'm kind of forced by the, if I can be honest, emotional intelligence. Okay. If, if you can deal with that, please, without... An, so my question is, I've consulted that with um, truly senior devotees in the movement, and, um, and they agreed with me. It, 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 no credit to me whatsoever, it's just that for the record, as a matter of fact, and there would be immensely, again, of, of my interest and perhaps others to hear your response. And, and my question is this, a, a question and statement simultaneously, that prema was, is, and it will be bhakti. However, bhakti never was, never is, and never will be prema. That's a play on words. Nitya Siddha Krishna Prema Saro Kabo Noi Svavanadi Siddhi Chitte Kodi Udoi in the hearts of all living entities, pure love for Krishna exists. Siddha Prabhupada quotes that verse, but he says it a different way. He said, Nitya Siddha Krishna Bhakti, Sadhu Gabonoi. He replaces the word prema with the word bhakti. Bhakti and prema are synonymous. When you speak of bhakti, you speak of pure bhakti. Um, there are different levels of bhakti, but when it's understood in its terminology, bhakti and prema are synonymous. <laughs> But there are different levels of bhakti. Of course. As opposed to prema is one. Yeah, prema is the highest level of bhakti. It's pure bhakti. But bhakti, acta, uh, bhakti actually means 
pure bhakti. When we use the word bhakti, we, we say unalloyed bhakti or ananya bhakti, pure bhakti. But when you read interpretations of bhakti being played out by different level persons, you'll find bhakti is mixed with karma, you know, fruit of activities, with jnana, philosophical speculation on the absolute truth, or even uh, the desire for mystic power. Bhakti can be mixed in with that, and that's not pure bhakti. But when you use the word bhakti by itself, it means, it means prema, actually. In its definition of form, yeah. Is that, that corresponds to what you heard before? I've heard that, to, to be exact, by quoting that they said that, that those senior devotees, most senior devotees would say, if, if one does it because the parents said so, or even the guru said so, but if it does not come from, from the, the way heart, of the yeah, heart, yeah. then it's a problem. Well, so, in other words, they, they told me also that, that, that the highest standard is not bhakti, but it's prema bhakti. Yeah. That's correct, prema bhakti. But when you take it from a shastric point of view, and then the terminology is used, the word bhakti and prema is synonymous. But if when you want to break it down and you want to understand bhakti and how it, how it's mixed in with, like you say, well, I'm doing it because I'm supposed to do it. That's that's not prema. This, the prema is not there. But the element of bhakti is there because there is obedience to superiors. And that is the principle where bhakti is established. Obedience to Krishna, obedience to Krishna's representative. Yeah. So you've mentioned um, very kindly that we, we, we should or indeed must pray to the Lord and we must listen and, and so forth and so on. But you did not mention that we should or indeed must specifically and in a very targeted specific way love the Lord yeah, well. as the highest why you didn't mention that love what? means obedience if you love someone you'll follow what they say in this case Krishna is telling us how to develop love for him you know he said Sarvadharma just surrender to me become my devotee now worship me, offer your homage to me, surely you will come to me. He says it in the Bhagavad Gita, 1865. So the principles of love is the principle of obedience. That's where love starts. If there's no obedience, then love will never develop. <laughs> and uh, love means to work in such a way as to act to please the Lord. We can do activities and call it, well, we can call it devotional service, but if it's not done with the pleasing the Lord, then it's not pure bhakti, it's mixed bhakti. So there's elements of bhakti on all levels, but if you talk about bhakti in its purest sense, that means Rupa Goswami gives the definition of pure bhakti. Ayabila sita sunya jnana karmana navritam anukulena krishna silam bhakti uttamam that it has to be free from desires for personal gain, food of activity, philosophical speculation on the absolute truth. It has to be for Krishna with the intention to please Krishna. That activity is pure bhakti, which leads to prema. <laughs> when I simply want to please the Lord in the activity I perform, that's the best thing you can do. And love will develop after, at a certain stage when you cultivate that mood. But that cultivation of that mood means to hear about Krishna, to hear about his pastimes, just like we're doing, we're spending the whole day hearing about Ram's pastimes. We're getting attracted to Ram, his qualities, his characters, how he deals with his devotees. All these awaken our attraction for Krishna, or for Ram. And then as the attraction, increases, our attachment increases. As our attachment increases, our love will start to awaken. It's like when you want to have a relationship in this world, first you get to know somebody, 
you spend some time with them, you learn about their qualities, you become attracted to their characteristics, their qualities, you want to spend more time, and you think how to please them. It's the same thing, but applied to the Supreme Lord, that's all. So now we're entering this week, is, with your kind permission, the kindest permission, I really appreciate, uh, um, of the resurrection of a master of guru or all of the above Christ. He, I think, he's, if I'm not mistaken, he said, uh, could have been Paul, his closest uh, follower, but I think it was Christ himself who said that there is faith, hope, and love. But the greatest is love. Would you agree with that? Yeah, but it takes faith and hope to get to love. <laughs> Love, when you try to jump up to love, it could be just a sentiment. These words are not mine. That's yeah. the Guru Christ words. Yeah, but yeah, getting to that platform of love is a process. It doesn't just happen because I want to, you know. Uh, I, if you want to love the Lord, then the Lord will show you how to do it through His mercy. And hope and faith are also part of that process. <laughs> If you don't have any faith, how will you have any love? <laughs> Thank you most kindly. Thank you. Cool. Uh, nice questions. How are we doing on time? Are we all right? Do we have time for more questions? Yeah. yeah if there's anyone else, yeah. I saw another hand over here somewhere, but now it's not there anymore. Hare <laughs> Krishna Thank you. I'm going to ask Marge, you know, the story of Lord Ram, the biography, or like any famous person, is the same. But we're all gathered here, we've heard it year after year, but we still love it, and we love it more, and we love it even more because you came to explain it to us. But it, It'll get better next year. Hare <laughs> Krishna. <laughs> and the year after. <laughs> but to ex in, for a mundane person like me, how to explain that to people outside? Because sometimes they can't understand it. <laughs> because material life means you get tired of what you're doing, and then you have to do something different in order to stay in, stay ho hopeful in material life. And material life means you have to keep changing. Even if you keep the same activity, you have to change it and do it in a different way. But we can just chant Hare Krishna and it gets better each time we don't have to do anything else <laughs> we can take prasadam each time it's an experience we can sit and discuss philosophical teachings and each time we, we get inspired by what we hear and what we what we speak that's spiritual life spiritual life looks sometimes like material life but it, the goal is different and that's what makes it spiritual it's connected to Krishna. It's connected to, to something above this material. That's why if you try to explain it to the person who has no connection with it, they can't understand it unless they come and practice it themselves. So they just can't because their life is to somehow or other keep doing things in different ways to stop getting bored. <laughs> yeah. Material life is boredom. That's it. Some people say suffering, that's true, but boredom really fits the word. It's boring. <laughs> One other thing, Marge, to throw caution to the wind, please correct me if I'm wrong. I've come to the understanding, a lot was spoken about the uh, Lakshman record today, right. that actually in the Valmiki Roman, that is not actually there. Maybe through folklore or something, it's come to take place. Yeah, that's true. but. I can't give an answer to that because I don't really know. So I've heard it. I've heard it. I guess it's in uh, Tulsi Das's Ramayan? Ram Charita Manas, yeah. Is it in Kumbi's Ramayan too? Kumbi is another author of the Ramayan. Yeah. It's in Kumbi's Ramayan, yeah. So two out of three. <laughs> but we are told that the most authentic version of the Ramayana is Valmiki's. So, like that. But if you read Tulsi's Ramayana, ooh, it's so beautiful. 
and so poetic, and especially the marriage scene, right? It's, yeah, it's, it's like pure poetry with so much devotion. But uh, the philosophical teachings are more can, can correct in terms of the Siddhanta of Vaishnava culture in, uh, in uh, Valmiki's Ramayana. And they say he's the original author of the Ramayana also. And that's true, that's true if you study their history. Where do you reside? Uh... Nowhere. Oh. <laughs> right, I mean, right now, here. <laughs> where are you from? Uh, uh, physically or biologically or both? Oh. Are you from America or from this country? Uh, if that's a fair, maybe it's not a fair question. Well, you're right, it's not a fair question. <laughs> <laughs> Forgive me, please. Because I, I beg your forgiveness. No, I understand. You're so you're so kind and so you're so gracious in everything you do. But I don't want to get the subject matter on me right now. That's not the idea. We're trying to keep it on God. <laughs> That's if if I would want to, at some point I'm going to go to America or go back to America or or to Poland or all of the above. So I. If I would want to look for you for more guidance and more yeah, well. inspiration, where would I look? Uh, physically, I mean physically. <laughs> not, not necessarily online. You see that person there? Uh -huh. Yeah, he, okay. he knows a lot about me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, not everything he'll tell you you should believe, but anyway. <laughs> But he can give you my email address. <laughs> that much he can do. <laughs> I, I don't do. I don't touch computers. So that's. Oh, wonderful! Wonderful. Another reason why I wanted to see you personally, potentially or possibly. I still write letters <laughs> occasionally. <laughs> what address? What address should I use? He'll give you all the details. If he doesn't come through, you can ask someone else. <laughs> uh, yes, Mataji, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, thank you so much. Please accept my humble obeisances. And thank you so much for this wonderful lecture. It was it was totally mesmerizing to, to hear it from you and, and so many things to think and to reflect. Thank you so much for saying everything that you've said. Uh, just one small question. You, you, you said that um, Rama and Sita, they never were separated because they were thinking of each other. And just, you know, from my point of view, uh, like, that now I'm, uh, I'm on that stage in my life when I'm aspiring some guru. And I'm, I'm trying to develop relations with him. Right. And uh, I'm thinking, so but, uh, whether it would be enough just, you know, when I think of him, so it will be enough to, to develop my relations with him? You have to hear what he has to say. <clears throat> That's the connection. The, word, the connection with the spiritual master is his instructions. So absorb yourself in his instructions or his words, whatever he says. You know, you, you, you hear that regularly and then you build a relationship based on that. Because the spiritual master is not the body, he's the principle of devotional service to Krishna. So you're connecting with him and you're connecting with Krishna through him. And so that relation comes by what is called Vakya, his words. His words, his teachings, his practical guidance. This is the connection like that. Physical proximity is nice, but it's not the relationship. The relationship is on a higher level what he's saying, what he's teaching, then you make that, you know, the affair of your heart, and that develops the relationship. Thank you so much, Hare Krishna. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so yes, we have Mr. Raj here. Thank you, Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to all of the Maharaj, there are so many life lessons in there. I'd like to pick the one about criticism. Lord Ram heard the criticism and acted on it. 
In our lives, we hear so much criticism. Sometimes it's because of our faults. Sometimes it may be because people just like to criticise and then criticise whatever we do. So how do we learn? What should we do? And how do we learn from all of the criticism that we hear? Well, if it's constructive, why not take it? You have to evaluate, well, what that person's saying, maybe I can maybe I can learn from that. So if you take it as criticism, you may fail to benefit from it. But you can also learn. Of course the idea of criticism is in itself negative. But some we can also turn something negative into something positive by taking some just like I had an example where one person was criticizing me and I was didn't like the idea that I was being criticized but then when I thought what they were saying it, it made sense and so I, then I changed I was doing something that I, wasn't wrong but it wasn't right at the same time it just was out of place and I was being criticized for that and then I thought alright I can stop it <laughs> So, and since then I stopped it. So, so I figured, all right, so I didn't like the idea of being criticized, and the way it was given it was even worse. But at the same time, I thought, all right, there's a point there. So, yeah, you can benefit from that. But if you sometimes you evaluate and you don't see the point there, then you might think, well, you know, what are they saying? But you can also see that maybe they're not criticizing what they're saying, but they're criticizing me for what for something that I am. In other words, I may be proud, so this criticism is helping me to get rid of my pride. Or I may be acting in a, a, an arrogant way, or I might be... It might be you know, there might be something you can learn about yourself that you can improve either your character or your activities take it that way as Prabhupada used to say don't be disturbed by the instrument of your karma it's not easy huh? we didn't say it was <laughs> to go back to God is not easy either <laughs> But that's part of it. It's it's really shedding away from things of our character that, that does that doesn't fit into our development in spiritual life and adopting other things that we need to adopt. The soul by nature is pure. The soul is good, but it's covered by our conditioned nature, by how we are experiencing the world and how we act and interact with others. So that, that interaction and action with others becomes our way of life and it covers our, our good qualities. And then the good qualities never leave us, they're always there, but they're hidden. And this is what Krishna consciousness is about, it's about bringing them out. Because everyone by nature is good, even the demons are good. But demon means really covered, that's all. More covered than most living entities so yeah so we can we can learn when we get some criticism or some some situation that causes us to to think why is it happening so could we say Maharaj that the devotee who is truly sincerely actually secure in the most loving Radha Krishna consciousness will not mind to be criticized. No, no, you take it as praise. <laughs> we'll take it as what? Praise. <laughs> praise. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It's also said praise and blame are all the same, they're only different in name. <laughs> so because it's like, you know it's like if a flea comes on an elephant, 
can the elephant be disturbed? You won't even notice the flea. <laughs> so one who is on that level of pure love for Krishna, it's you know, not going to be bothered by that. In fact, then even he won't even notice it. If he does notice it, he'll simply think, you know, it's that person's good qualities. And so. well, that's another level. That's not easy to attain either. Haridas Thakur was being beaten in 22 marketplaces and they were trying to kill him, but the same persons that were beating him, he was praying for their deliverance. He was praying to the Lord, please give them liberation, free them from their, their bad activities. He had no enmity or enmity, nothing negative towards them. He was only thinking of their own welfare. And so that's a Vaishnava. A Vaishnava doesn't take anything personal. He takes everything as the, as the arrangement of God for himself. Sri Sri Radha Govinda Dham Ki Jai Hare Krishna, thank you. <laughs> I'm glad you said Dham. Because, <laughs> yeah, it's an abode, Radha Govinda Dham. Anything else? Anyone else would like to? Can I take a question? Oh, yeah. Yes, thank you so much for a wonderful class. I want to ask Don't about... keep saying that, I might believe you. <laughs> 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 well, that's okay. You, you, that's your good qualities. <laughs> I want to ask you about Sita Devi um, in, the, in the Krishna Dharma book that follows Vamiki's uh, book of Ramayana. Right. Uh, he talks about Devavati, like what, what kind of, the, the, the like what kind of book? Krishna uh, uh, Sita Devi in her previous life. Premabati. Vedavati is her name. Oh, Vedavati, Be okay, yeah. yeah. And then she, when Rama touched her, mm -hmm. when he grabbed her by the hair, she, with her mystic power, she, she caught her hair and she released herself from yeah. him. And then after that, she burns her body. Right. She curses him and she burns her body. Yeah. And then in another version, that is not Krishna Dharma version, appears that he takes the ashes and he puts them in a golden box and he takes the golden box to Lanka. And then he kept the golden box for a while. I was even visited the golden box until a lot of bad uh, omens start happening. And then his wives and, and the sages from there told him to get rid of the box. Mm -hmm. And then the box is thrown in the middle of the ocean. And then by the providence, the box goes back into India and it's found by some bugglers that buried the box under a tree that later on is the place where King Janaka was going to do his fire sacrifice. And then when he opens the box, instead of finding the ashes, he finds the baby. The baby. And that is Janaka. Janaki. Janaki. Sita baby. I mean, where is the source of that? Because I read in the internet, but I just cannot really... It's not in the Krishna Dharma book. It's not, I don't know if it's in the Valmiki book. I have to be honest, it's the first time I heard it. <laughs> yeah, so, I don't, so the source is unknown to me. It's Kambi? Yeah, Kambi. Kambi? Yeah, if you want to read, just like Subhavi Last Purple has just did a series on Kambi, He's combining Valmiki and Kumbi's Ramayana into one, and you'll find a lot of these more esoteric pastimes that you don't hear normally in Valmiki's Ramayana. Yeah. But Kumbi's, Kumbi's Ramayana is bona fide. It is, oh yeah, it's bona fide. Huh? Most, most bona fide. You from Sri Shampada? I'm from India. Yeah. From that. Yeah. When Kambi wrote his Ramayan, and he's from the Sri Sampradaya, he, uh, he was criticized by the Brahmins. Who are you to write the Ramayana? This is not bona fide. So he said, no, this is, this is actually the Ramayana. And he said, no. Oh. He said, I'll prove it. So he took his work in the form of the written material, and he, and he came to Lord Nisringadev, and he invited all the Brahmins to come. He placed it at the lotus feet of the Sringadev and he prayed to the Lord Sringadev to give an indication. 
And after some time, Lurna Shringadev was Yoga Nishringa. He was sitting like this. And after some time, the deity raised his hand like this, which means, yes, this is bona fide. He gave, he gave uh, you know, approval. So Kumbi's Mar uh, a Ramayan, you find a lot of things that you don't read anywhere else. It's interesting. Because the Ramayan is so extensive. And so in the Bhagavatam is like that also. We have 18,000 verses of the Bhagavatam, but Chiva Goswami writes in his Sandarbhas that Bhagavatam contains one billion verses in the, in the higher planets. So yeah, us earthlings, we only get a small portion. <laughs> but sometimes we get more. <laughs> Thank you. And gracias. <laughs> when I'm teaching to the kids, they say, Mrs. Sonia, you got it wrong. It didn't happen like this. It happened like this. And they really have all these different versions. And when I'm teaching the people... Well, they're thinking. That's good. That's nice. And that's what we want. Stimulate this thought process where they discuss it. Yeah. And they get interested into it. And then they argue, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, Mrs. Sonia, you got it wrong. It didn't happen like this. It happened like this. And they're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you're both right. <laughs> well, I used to say there's some people who like to eat prashadam and some people like to serve prashadam. So they asked, what's better? Probably said it's the same. Because <laughs> it's transcendental. Is there someone else? Yeah. Thanks so much. We got someone next. Is there prashadam coming up next? <laughs> That's just, uh, I was just wondering if I was holding up progress here. No. Yeah. Okay. Thanks so much. Um, my question is a little bit off topic, but in the ten offenses a little higher. Oh sorry. My question is a little bit off topic, but in the ten offenses, the ninth offense is to yeah. um preach not, the preach, preach the glories of the holy name to the faceless. Us. Yeah. So isn't that what the essence of preaching is? Hmm? Isn't that what preaching is? Yeah. So when you preach to somebody We make that mistake. So it, we do. So we're committing an offense. When you do it one on one, it becomes offense. But when you do it in a group, then there's no way you can prevent that. So do we have to suffer the consequences of that offense? If you do it one on one, that's what it really means. That someone is resistant. Are you giving them more than they can handle, and they also actually become negative towards that? And then you're ruining that person's progress in spiritual life. So that you should avoid, but when just like we're giving a class now, so you never know who may be there sitting who doesn't have that, you know, faith. So that's just the way it is. But then you get some you can't avoid it. Given the early name to that person. But we don't speak about the integrated pastimes of the Lord and in, in His leelas, because you know ordinary people will will become confused misunderstand so we avoid that we have to preach you know and that's just the way it is yeah so the injunction is when you're one-on-one -on -one, avoid that okay anything else i think we covered it looks like everyone wants to do something different now <laughs> All right. Are they having? Is it the prashadam is finished now? It's, it's, huh? Just kirtan. Okay. So thank you very much. And thank you all for coming to celebrate Lord Ram's appearance day. It's the best thing we can do on this day. And it, the benefit is eternal. Every time we come together and hear and chant the glories of the Lord, it awakens within us to our devotion. And that's, even if we forget, it's never lost. It's like gaining a treasure, but somehow or another, not remembering where you put it. <laughs> so it's always there, and every time you touch it, again, it becomes alive. So, and each time you touch it, it becomes more alive. So, Sadhu Sangha is very powerful, and when it's focused on the glories of the Lord, it, it awakens our attraction for Krishna, for Ram. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Shri Prabhupada Ki.
Holy Maharaj Ki Jai.